Hello everyone. Sometimes in amateur radio practice, there comes a period when you want to build something to calm your nerves. Something soulful, warm, and vintage. Nostalgia is an uncontrollable thing, so don't ask me why I spent two whole days assembling a structure that I'll probably never use. On top of everything, I started the assembly in the last hours of the departing year 2018. I have never hidden the fact that I greatly value Soviet electrical appliances, even the most unsuccessful ones. In my distant childhood, I had the chance to work for a couple of hours with the IPS One Power Supply. Just a regular adjustable voltage stabilizer. It seemed like nothing special, but this unit left a lasting impression on me. Unusual, compact, and even by today's standards, quite stylish. Almost 20 years later. I decided to assemble the circuit of this power supply, and to do so entirely with authentic Soviet radio components. I spent an entire day searching for them, even though there aren't that many components in the circuit. I designed the board on the last day. Then began the tedious process of searching for the necessary parts in the attic. Speaking of the attic, it refers to an entire room filled to the brim with my junk. Assembling the power supply unit took at most about half an hour. Here are the flags and the favorite KT 315s. With a couple of 361s and MLTs, just like in the good old days. Almost all components are Soviet, except for one of the trimmers made by Tesla. Yes, and it's not the Tesla you're thinking of. It's about the good old Tesla company in Czechoslovakia, which produced almost everything. Let's return to our power source. Here is the schematic in front of you. It is built on six transistors, five of which are low power. The power transistor is a composite. According to the schematic, a KT829 is installed. I install the much more powerful legendary KT827. Also a composite with reverse conductivity. There are minor deviations in my schematic, which do not affect the operation. We have four variable resistors. Two of them are trimmers. The others are intended for coarse and fine adjustment of the output voltage. The first resistor is responsible for current limiting, a kind of current protection. If desired, this resistor can be brought outside. In that case, the unit will have the capability to limit current. The original circuit is designed for an output voltage from 0 to 15 volts and a current up to 1, 1.2A. And, believe me, this will be enough for most tasks. But the power of the circuit can be increased by replacing the power transistor and reducing the resistance of the current sensor. The second trimmer resistor will allow you to set the upper limit of the output voltage. It should be noted that the output voltage of the circuit is always lower than the input voltage, in this case, by about 2 to 3 volts. The reference voltage source is built on a pair of KT315, KT361 transistors. 315 to 361, and a Zener diode. Then the output voltage from the reference source is fed through a divider to the amplification stage. The current limiting circuit is as old as the hills. The current sensor is represented by a low ohm resistor. If the output load draws a current above the set limit, the lower transistor will activate as the voltage drop across the current sensor is sufficient to turn it on. Following it, the second transistor will also open, which will dampen the signal at the base of the control transistor, causing it to start closing, and consequently, the output transistor will also close. About the construction as a whole. In general, those who have worked with Soviet components know their advantages and disadvantages. But to be honest, they had more disadvantages. Take, for example, the KT315. They are, of course, great but fragile. The leads can easily break off if the transistor is used. And then, these beauties, commonly known as flags, have many drawbacks. The main ones are high leakage and the fact that they break even with very gentle handling. Soviet variable resistors are a whole separate topic, I won't even talk about them. And electrolytic capacitors. I think I'll stay silent about them too. No, well, there were good ones, but there were quite a few bad ones too. But the KT-827, a transistor that is very much in demand these days, it easily outperforms modern counterparts.
The transistor is just amazing. It's a pity it costs as much as a Lamborghini. Well, let's finally test this newly made power supply with ancient radio components. I'll say in advance that the current shunt I installed has less resistance than in the schematic. Therefore, the maximum current my little unit can deliver is about 5 to 7A. In this case, the transistor needs very serious cooling. Let's start, perhaps, with the range of output voltage adjustment. About 19V DC is supplied to the input. The adjustment, as we can see, is very good, starting from zero. The variable resistor responsible for smooth adjustment is quite appropriate here. A full turn of the slider on this resistor allows for precise adjustment within the range of V. Now let's check the stability of the output voltage. Currently, a constant voltage of about 30 is being supplied to the input of the stabilizer from a rugged Soviet adjustable power source. I made a separate video about this power supply, but I haven't uploaded it yet. Essentially, it's a transformer with galvanic isolation and a safe output voltage. And it didn't have any smoothing capacitors. I added them later on. Let's get back to the experiment. The multimeter shows the set output, voltage of the homemade stabilizer. The voltmeter shows the constant voltage that is supplied to the input of the stabilizer. We lower the input voltage from 30 to 20 volts, simulating a severe voltage drop in the network. As we can see, the output voltage from our stabilizer dropped by about 100 MV. And that's a pretty good result considering the simplicity of the circuit, and the fact that the reference source here is built on the basis of a Zener diode. Thus, with fluctuations of 5 to 6 volts, the output voltage remains very stable. Now let's check the drop in output voltage at different currents, and let's start with a value of 2A. In this experiment, the red multimeter shows the voltage at the output of the stabilizer, and the yellow one shows the current. As we can see, the drop is only 200 MV. The same at a current of 4A. Three hundred and fifty MV. Is that a lot or a little? Considering that there are losses in the wires and that the power supply is quite basic at a current of four A. Such a drop is quite a normal phenomenon. I would say this is a very high indicator for power supplies of this class. Another important point. Turning the current limit regulator does not affect the output. Voltage of the unit if there is no load. The maximum current limit in my case is up to 7A. But it's highly advised not to run at such currents. The shunt dissipates excessive power. But around 5A can be drawn without issues. Just take a shunt rated at 10W with resistance in ohms. The minimum current is 600 to 700 milliamperes. Overall, the current adjustment is also very smooth. For a classic circuit with a current of 1A, it's best to use an iron transformer as the power supply with a secondary voltage, 20 to 25V at a current of about 2A. As a diode rectifier, you can use KD202 diodes with the VDJ index. In general, check the reference, KD202 can handle up to 5A. It's preferable to use 5A with a reverse voltage starting from 70V with the A and B index for 30A volts. They can also be used, but only as a last resort. The ideal option is to use KD242. 
and similar ones. Filtering capacitors. It's highly recommended to use 50 volts. Assemble a battery with a capacity of 3 to 4,000 microfarads. The more, the better. In general, about capacitors, especially electrolytics, I strongly recommend checking their capacitance, leakage, and internal resistance before using them in a circuit. The capacitance should be close to the stated value. Leakage should be as minimal as possible. And the lower the internal resistance, the better. And, of course, cooling. A heat sink for the power transistor is essential, especially if you want to draw large currents from the circuit. Don't forget that the circuit is linear and the transistor will have a tough time. If you're interested in power supply topics or Soviet electronics in general, you'll find links to my other videos on this topic in the description. On stressful days, assembling simple designs really helps to relax, regardless of your status in the radio engineering field. Rate this video, share it with friends, and hit the bell to stay updated. You can download the printed circuit board with the project archive via the link in the description. With that, I have to say goodbye. As always, this was Cassianoka with you. Until we meet again, Toka.